Well, hey, Bible Scene Investigators, Dr. Doug here. I'm sorry that we can't be together in person, but hopefully this is the next best thing. So uh, we're going to go through our PowerPoint presentation together. I'm going to narrate it for you and explain part two and part three of interpretation. But to begin with, since it's been more than a week since we've been together, I want to start off by just doing a quick review. So... Without further ado, remember that the second step in our Bible scene investigation in our interpretation of the Bible is, of course, interpretation, which answers the question, what does the text mean? Of course, we've been spending all of our time looking at observation, answers the question, what does the text say? So now, last time we were together, we moved into the second step of, in, uh, of our Bible study, which is interpretation answering the question, what does the text mean? And so as we come to the step of interpretation, we begin to think outside of the box in order to connect the dots. And if you remember, we had that exercise about how to connect the dots last time we were together. So the definition of interpretation, what does the text mean, is to determine or clarify and explain the meaning of a Bible passage according to the original author's intended meaning and meaning to and for his original audience according to the context of their historical situation. And you remember that this was our handout, so you should have the handout. I did email you the handout. I did email you this presentation, and I did email you the assignment uh, earlier last week. So hopefully you have that. But if you don't, just uh, send me an email, douglas.brooks at cbshouston.edu, and, well, I'll, I'll send you all the materials and everything that you need to be successful on this next assignment that we're going to be giving out today. So interpretation involves the discovery of the meaning of the biblical text, the reasons, the purposes, the implications, the interrelationships, and the principles. So in interpretation step, we seek to recreate what did it mean to the original author and audience. So we, we need to understand, friends, what the text meant to the original audience. What, the, what was the author trying to communicate in his intended meaning? And then, after that, we do that, then we relive it. We relive how would I have experienced this? How does that look like uh, things today in 21st century America? And then finally, we want to be able to understand how to retell or how we would express this or tell that today. Those are our three phases in the interpretation step. So a key concept here is, in observation, we ask information-gathering questions, and in, inter in interpretation, we ask meaning questions, like why. So uh, the definition phase, we, we did an exercise in class where we did the word study, and then this is the definition phase where we determined the author's intended meaning of significant or key terms or phrases or statements, asking what did this term or phrase or statement mean. And of course, uh, that word parousia, or, or the word coming, we looked at the 22 different places in the New Testament where that word appeared, and we discovered that the only way that that word is used is in a literal, obvious sense, that's obvious and, and physically apparent to all, which helped us to understand that the coming of the Lord will be a physical, obvious event that is uh, apparent to all. Now we're moving into the rationale phase, which is where we determine the reason that the author used a certain term or phrase or statement. And we ask, why did the author use this term or phrase or statement in this way to these people at this time? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. And then finally, the last thing we're going to look at today as well is the implication phase, where we determine what is the author's intended point. What's the significant point or idea or truth that the author is expressing to his audience? So we're asking, so what? What does this say about God? What does it say about man? What does it about, say about life? What does it say about me? And so definition phase, where we determine the author's intended meaning of significant key terms, phrases, or statements, asking what does the term, phrase, or statement mean, and how does that factor into our understanding? Well, we do it through word studies, and we did that exercise on Perusia in class. That was last week. Today, we're going to look at the other two phases of interpretation, which are number two, the rationale phase, where we're determining the reason that the author used a certain term, phrase, or statement, 
asking why did the author use this term, phrase, or statement in this way to these people at this time. And that's what we sort of did last time that we were together when we looked at that word parousia, that word coming. We determined that the reason that the author used that term or phrase or statement in that way to these people at that time was to indicate clearly that the Lord would return physically, obviously, apparent to all. And then finally, the implication phase is where we would determine what is the author's intended point, what's the significant point, the idea, the truth that the author is expressing to his audience in answering that question. So, with interpretation, there is an importance of context in interpretation. In the rationale phase, we're looking at doing what we call biblical background studies. And of course, this is also with your handout. It comes with uh, that key to living by the book the key handouts that I sent you all, so I gave you the whole course. And if you don't have that for any reason, send me an email and I'll send it to you. So the importance of context and interpretation, because of course context is king. Very good, very good. Okay, so the definition of context is the part of the text or statement that surrounds a particular word or passage and determines its meaning, uh, the literal context of the passage and the circumstances in which an event occurs or the setting or the background, the historical context of the passage. So there are some important contexts in interpretation when we do biblical background studies and, and so forth. It, it's important that we understand the grammatical textual components of the passage, how the words were used historically. And then we understand the historical, both the secular and the biblical events, the empires, the eras, etc. What what's going on in history around that time? And then we'll also look at the importance of some of the geographical components of the text. What's the geography of the time? You know, and uh, I believe that I gave you the example of uh, the fact that the Mount of Olives is actually a strategic military point in entering. Jerusalem, and it was significant that Jesus entered that way and entered the Mount of Olives riding on a donkey. And so if we look at some historical uh, things, and if we factor in the geographical, and then we add the cultural, or the customs and manners and societal norms of the time, we would find that in, in biblical times, kings would ride on a donkey through their kingdoms to give an indication that it was a time of peace. And so A, what we see, Jesus ride on the donkey saying, I'm a king. B, he's riding into Jerusalem in a strategic military point on a donkey. So he's saying, I'm coming as the king of peace. And we would understand these things, friends, by looking at the grammatical, textual, the historical, the geographical, and the cultural components of the passage. See, continuing to look at that, uh, the grammatical textual, how words were used historically. You know, we, we looked at that passage in Matthew where Jesus said, and, and when you pray, don't pray like the pagans do. And that word, batalageos, it kind of sounds like baba, baba, baba. Don't use meaningless repetition. You know, and when, when we look at that word, uh, it, it sounds like, say, you know, you would be babbling on. Don't babble on like the pagans do thinking that their many words will get them what they want. Instead, what did Jesus say? Pray like this. He didn't say pray this. He said pray like this. And that's what we call the Lord's Prayer, you know, our, the, our Father. Also, uh, in uh, Matthew 5.39, we looked at that, you know, do not resist an, an evil person. And uh, 1 Corinthians 12.11, y'all can go back. Now that this is recorded, you can just hit pause and you, can, and you can actually look at these passages yourself and look at the grammatical textual components of the passage. And I'm doing this for exp expedience to, uh, to get you through this so you have something to work with so you can complete your assignment that is going to be due this Thursday. So the grammatical textual, that's what we looked at there. The historical, we looked at Psalm 51. And uh, as it compared to uh, what happened in 1 Samuel 16, 12 to 14, where we saw that uh, King David was anointed with oil and the spirit 
of the Holy Spirit descended on him, very much like what it did with King Saul when King Saul was anointed as king. And then, of course, in Psalm 51, David's praying, Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the salvation of my soul. And we get the idea, if we're mis misunderstanding the historical significance of those statements, that you can lose your salvation. But no, no, no. What we're looking at there is the anointing of a king. And so because of David's sin with Bathsheba, that, uh, that adultery and murder that he committed there, he's praying to the Lord, don't take my kingship away like you did with King Saul. And I'm going to adjust this. I know that might be flipping some of you uh, folks out who are obsessive compulsive. compulsive. So I'm going to straighten that there. That's much better. All right, in Matthew 12, 22, uh, the, the mute demon and Messiah, feel free to go there and look that passage up. And uh, Jonah and the Ninevites and their worship of Dagon, some historical cultural uh, components of the book of Jonah as it relates to the Ninevites. Also in Exodus 7 through 12, the 10, ten plagues of Egypt, uh, of course, those are all related historically uh, the Lord lays waste to every single one of the Egyptians' gods. And you notice there, you know, with the blood, with the frogs, with the gnats, with the flies, with the livestock that were diseased, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, and the death of the firstborn. Of course, we don't see there on the Egyptian deity, uh, of course, uh, Pharaoh himself was considered a deity. And so you see all the deities there. So God is saying, <laughs> those are false gods, and I'll show you by what I do with the things that you hold dear uh, according to each one of those false gods. Historical. So grammatical, textual, historical, and then of course geographical, the geography of the time there. And uh, we talked about Gehenna, which is the trash dump there in, um, in Jerusalem, and it was just a stinky germ-infested, nasty, hot place. And uh, they, they and the, the text compares hell to that. And again, a geographical component of that. Psalm 23, 4, Yea, through I walk through the shadow of the valley of death. You get this, this idea of this, this aura of, of death. And, you know, perhaps you've been to Death Valley in, uh, in California. Very similar to, uh, to this depiction there. But feel free to read through Psalm 23, to look at that as well. Grammatical, textual, historical, geographical, and then of course cultural. The customs, the manners, the societal norms of the time, we want to look at those components of the text as well. And uh, John 14, 1 through 3, you see the Jewish wedding customs there. When Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, what he's talking about there is, that, and then the culture would have understood this very clearly, that when the bridegroom is engaged to his bride, what he does during the engagement period is he goes back to his father's house and he builds, actually builds on to his father's house a place for he and his bride to dwell. And when he's finished with, with building that house, he comes back for his bride. They have the wedding and the celebration. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here with his disciples and with you and I, we understand very clearly that Jesus will come back for us. We are his bride, the bride of Christ. What a, what a marvelous cultural depiction of what Jesus is doing right now. And uh, the, the seating at the Last Supper, I think I drew a, a, an illustration of that. And next time we're together, I'll, I'll expand on that as far as uh, an understanding of the culture there uh, with, with the, the specifics of the seating and how people were placed at the Last Supper. So some passages may require knowledge of all content, all four contexts. They, they may need that. And uh, you can look at Matthew 16, 13 through 20, Acts 16, 16 through 18. Uh, and, and you can do that. But the bottom line is, if you know the historical cultural circumstances in the background, it can help you think outside the box in order to connect the dots. You can reach an accurate interpretive conclusion where and how do we find this kind of information? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are two sources. Of course, the Bible itself is its best, uh, best source of interpretation. And I'm going to get this straight here as well. And some reference books for background studies. Uh, background commentaries. Not devotional or applicational. Uh, you want to look for, for background commentaries. And I'm going to show you a picture of one right here. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's a little pricey, but uh, this is one of, uh, of, of many volumes there, the Expositor's Bible Commentary. And of course, you see there, that's your general Old Testament and New Testament. But uh, it, it's actually a 12-volume set that, uh, that has uh, quite a bit of exegetical information there uh, in uh, just really drawing the meaning out of every, every single verse in the Bible. Very, very helpful uh, in, in the realm of background commentaries, and, and so, but not devotional or applicational commentaries. You don't want to read those. Bible dictionaries, Bible encyclopedias. Another, uh, another fantastic source is, uh, is uh, both uh, Richard's Complete Bible Dictionary. So there's Richard's Complete Bible Dictionary. Maybe I'll just try to, try to get you uh, kind of a look at that there. And uh, Lawrence O. Richards does a wonderful thing, and, and I'll just show you, uh, you know, just how, you know, if you, you can look up really basically any, any term. You see the Lord's Day there. And it gives you, you know, the first day of the week, Sunday, which the early Christians adopted as their day of worship. And it goes on to explain all the details. And you just look that up. Any word or phrase that you can think of in the Bible, and Richard's Complete Bible Dictionary has that. Uh, but also, um, another, another wonderful uh, book that you could look at is... Uh, the Encyclopedia of, of Words. And so there's, there's another, another source there. An encyclo uh, you know, you got a dictionary, you got an encyclopedia there. And uh, also another one you could maybe get. You can get all of these on Amazon uh, for like 20 bucks for used very good. I, just, I, don't, I don't pay full price and brand new books. When I can find them for used very good, I go for it. So uh, just a couple of suggestions there on your, uh, on your Bible dictionaries and your encyclopedias. Wonderful, wonderful resources. Uh, of course, the Bible Atlas is also uh, another, another great source. Uh, uh, I use the, uh, the Zondervan, uh, the, the, the Zondervan uh, Bible Atlas there. And, uh, and you know, you can just, um, you, you get a picture of the lay of the land you know, for, for specific times uh, and periods, there's the Near East at the time of Pentecost, you know, and then you get some background there, the expansion of the church in Palestine and down there, the king, kingdom of Agrippa, Palestine. I mean, it gets really, really specific. Uh, great, great resource there as well. So, uh, you know, you don't want to go hog wild on all of this stuff because, I mean, you could spend, uh, you know, couple hundred maybe even you know thousands of dollars on on these resources uh some word study helps and uh where do i start well you know you gotta walk before you can run so uh, you want to you want to hit that strong's exhaustive concordance and uh we use the strong's concordance in uh, in in some way while we were doing our word study i basically gave you all of the places that the strong's concordance was going to show uh, you, but it looks like that, uh, Strong's Concordance, and of course you want the NASB, because of course we all have our NASB, uh, and it just shows you really every single place where a specific word shows up in the Bible, and then you can toggle over to, uh, to see, uh, what, uh, what all of those words, there's the Hebrew, you know, you can look at what the Hebrew words are for all of those words as well, so, Again, a uh, fantastic resource for, uh, for looking at uh, when, you, when you're doing word studies and so forth. Critical for, uh, for your word studies and, and so forth. Study Bible, I'd recommend maybe like MacArthur's or uh, Ryrie, uh, something like that. Uh, background comment commentary, I'd say IVP or Zondervan. Um, hard sayings commentaries, that's a great resource because what it shows you is a listing of every place in the Bible where people would say, well, that looks like a, a conflict or there or, or a contradiction. Hard saying says, well, this is where it says a, a contradiction. And in fact, this is why it's not a contradiction. So uh, just another, another club in the bag, if you will. Keyword study Bible, uh, that's also another source. Bible dictionary we talked about, Bible atlas we talked about. Computer Bible study software, you know, you got PC study Bible, you got word search. I like blueletterbible.com. It is a fabulous resource and it's free. 
if if you're loaded, uh, you know, to the gills with uh, some extra money, then uh, of course Logos is the uh, the Cadillac, if you will, or the Mercedes, uh, depending on uh, you know what kind of car you think is a super super car. Uh, Logos is uh, is is the very best there, and uh, Bible.org is also another another resource there. So uh, as we as we move into our our notes, uh, stage two of interpretation. What does it mean? We're reaching ultimately to reach an interpretive conclusion. So we, now we've talked about word studies. We've talked about asking questions in the in the four specific areas, and now we're looking to reach an interpretive conclusion. So how can we avoid reaching the wrong conclusion from the Bible? Well. Uh, how can we draw correct interpretive conclusions from God's Word? Well, there is a specific process. So let's look at that. The process is five steps. So number one, as always, we begin with prayer. Apart from Him, we can do nothing, you know, and the Holy Spirit will, uh, will guide us in all truth, right? So ask for it. And depend on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Study, friends, as if it all depends on you, but pray as if it all depends on the Holy Spirit, because you know it does. Because the natural man doesn't understand these things. They're, they're, they're foolishness to him. They're spiritually discerned. So we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to illuminate us to the truth. All right, so prayer sets the stage. It prepares your heart. A spiritually prepared mind will recognize significant points and truths more quickly and more definitively. Uh, you, of course, uh, we've looked at these passages. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 10 through 16 talks about spiritual wisdom. But ultimately, truth is spiritually discerned, friends, uh, with that willing heart of submission. And of course, feel free to go back and look at these passages, John chapter 7, 16 to 17. So number two, in your handout, thoroughly observe the passage. Of course, uh, that's our first step. Good observation is absolutely essential to guide the interpretation process. You can't know what it means unless you know what it says. That's why we spent half of our time on observation, friends. So you can't interpret if you don't see it. We spend seven weeks in observation, two and a half on interpretation, and one on application. Don't skip the observation process. You know, we want to leap to the conclusion, I know who did it, right? No, you don't. The Lord knows. So number three, make a list of interpretive questions. And uh, many of you have reached out to me, you know, because I sent you the exercise. I sent you this PowerPoint, but now I'm narrating it, uh, along with your, uh, with your assignment. And uh, we're going to talk very, uh, very much about what, uh, what these interpretive questions are designed to do. So based upon your prior observation, bombard the text with interpretive meaning questions. You can't know the right interpretive question to ask unless you've asked the right observation questions first. So this is meaning versus information. So far we've been gathering information. Now we're looking for meaning. So meditate on the passage. Some types of questions. We want to look for definition questions. What did the author mean by this? How would his audience have understood this word or term? That's how we do our word studies, right? Rationale questions. Why did the author use this term, this phrase, or this statement in this way to these people at this time? Examine the situation, the issue, and or the circumstances and, inter and determine, if you can, the reason. Now, you're not going to be able to answer all the questions that you ask, but it still doesn't hurt to ask them. And then finally, implication questions. What's the significant point, the idea, or the truth that the author's expressing to his audience? So what? Why, why does it say, what does it say about God, or about man, about life, about reality? So uh, let's do one. Our obscure passage over there in John 3.16. You know, okay, so for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so as we look at this, think about some of these questions. This will give you a real good insight into how to begin to ask these questions. Let's, li let's look at them. Ready? Here we go. Bombard the text with meaning questions. Be thinking in your mind before, you, uh, before we move on here. What kind of questions might I ask about this passage? Not observation questions. We already did that. So now we're looking for interpretive questions. 
And remember, it's not Jeopardy. You don't come up with the answer and then ask the question. So what are some meaning questions we could ask of the text? Well, why did God love the world? Maybe we might be able to determine that, maybe not. What do we, what do we mean by love? What's the implication of that word love in the context of God? Why did he give his son? Ooh. What is the implication of world? And what is world, what, what does he mean by world? What is eternal life? Was sending his son the only alternative? Hmm. What does it mean to perish? Boy, I hope we never figure that one out. Who is included in the world? How or why is Jesus his only begotten son? Why would we perish without believing in him? You see how we're developing these questions? These are all interpretive questions. We're trying to research these. We're going to look at, we're going to use all of our tools, the tools that I just showed you there, and we are going to try to determine if we can answer these questions. Like, could God have saved the world without sending his son? I think we know the answer to that, but we're saved. Why would a person want eternal life? <laughs> Might ask, why wouldn't they? What does it mean to believe in him? Ooh, boy, that's really important. That's, that would be an important question to answer, wouldn't it? How was his son qualified? Whoa, you have to bump over to Revelation to look at that one, right? Why believe in him? Great questions. So we research, once we ask all of these questions, you're gonna write all these questions down, you just bombard the text with questions, as many as you can come up with, and then we're gonna research to find answers to our interpretive questions. You're gonna consult the reference books for your background studies, the type of reference books, the study Bibles, the Bible dictionaries, the encyclopedias, the background commentaries, the concordances, you know, your Strong's, your Word Study Bible, your Bible Atlas, your Bible software, the internet. Uh, try to look for .orgs, not .coms, because you never know what you're going to get with a .com. So God has placed, it, placed gifted men and women in the church to provide these helps. Learn how to use them. So the important interpretive context for background studies are grammatical, our word studies, our historical, where we're getting biblical and Western civilization uh, into the mix there our geographical atlas, topography, and maps, and our culture, cultural, the manners, the customs, the societal norms. Those are our contexts for our background studies and determining all the questions we're going to ask. Sometimes the key will be several or all of these. So as you research, Keep the, these principles in mind. Of course, this is in your handout as well. You've got eight guiding principles of hermeneutics. Herman who? No, it's hermeneutics. That's the art and science of interpretation. Hermeneutics. So use common sense. We're not looking for hidden mystical messages. Use your gray matter. God intended clear communication. There's no Bible code. There's no Da Vinci code. There's no like secret, you know, hidden meanings. Read the text for its most natural normal meaning. Always ask, what would be the most natural, normal way to understand this? So I always interpret in light of the context of the whole Bible. Uh, yeah, you, you want to have a working knowledge of the whole Bible. You cross-reference passages. Uh, treasury of Scripture knowledge. That is another fabulous tool here. Uh, and it looks like this. Treasury of Scripture knowledge there. Uh, Hendrickson is, uh, is the author of that. Uh, it's complete with 500,000 scripture references and parallel passages organized to help you discover the truths of the Bible. So you want those cross-references? Dive right into the treasury of scripture knowledge and bam, there you go. So um, treasury of scripture knowledge, compare related Bible texts to let the Bible interpret itself. So you look at the verse, and as we've been doing, you're looking at the surrounding verses, you're looking at the chapter, you're looking at the book, and then the Testament, and of course the whole Bible, and they all have to tie together. We don't want to, we don't want to base a doctrine on one single verse. We want to, we want to look at the whole, whole Bible. It needs to, to be interrelated. Become your own walking, breathing, cross-reference tool. 
read the Bible. You know, friends, uh, God has placed us in circumstances right now where we might have a little bit more free time than normal. My prayer is that we would make best use of that by looking at the Bible and spending some time with the Lord. Remember, your best cross-reference tool is your own brain. Number three, be sure to, to factor in the type of literature that you're dealing with. Remember, in salt, you know, structure, atmosphere, literary form and terms, we use that during observation. Now we got to factor it in to interpretation. So literary form, we use that in observation. Now we're factoring it into interpretation. What kind of literature is this? How does it affect my interpretation? You must interpret within the context of the kind of literature that you're dealing with. Remember, we had our handout with, with, uh, with the literary form, so you can use that in your interpretation. So there's some tips about the literature. Does this apply directly or indirectly to us today? That is a very important question to answer. And if you remember, from time to time we were talking about this, the, the importance of our understanding the difference between prescriptive text and descriptive text. The descriptive text is describing simply what's happened there while the prescriptive text is something that is prescribed to you and I as believers, you see. In what way? Universal or limited? Poetry, think emotion. Figurative language, teaching a literal truth. Law, think penalty, think promise. Directly or indirectly to us, universal or limited, temporary or permanent. Historical narrative, you want to think plot, your storyline, your big picture. You want to look for life lessons in there and, and the, the moral of the story is and so forth. Parables, note the characters and situation. Remember, we looked at the occasion on a couple of those parables when we looked at that mark. We did the mark chart and we did the mark outline. Remember that? Note that the same parable given at different times and audiences can have a different meaning and a different interpretation. Why? Because if you're, if you're speaking to one audience, then it, it might apply to them in one way and apply to a different audience in a different way. Which leads me to just kind of peeking into the future here with application. As I mentioned repeatedly, there's only one correct interpretation, but there are many applications. With a letter, you want to think main topic. You want to think, what is the main issue under discussion? Who are the recipients? Uh, uh, Hebrews, you're looking at Christian. Are they Christians or non-Christians? Or are both? Uh, example, 1 Timothy. Why did Paul write this letter to Timothy? And why do they call it the pastoral epistles? Hmm. Prophecy, think specialized message. Not specifically to everyone, uh, Maybe a specific audience, a specific time, maybe to Israel, maybe to the church, maybe to a nation, maybe to believers. Remember, all fulfilled prophecy that has been fulfilled has been fulfilled literally. Interesting. All fulfilled prophecy that has been fulfilled has been fulfilled literally. So what does that say about future prophecy? Hmm... Proverbs, you want to think wisdom, you want to think general guidelines for skillful, wise living. Principles to live by, precepts, not absolutes, not a blank check, okay? Conclusion, you really must interpret within the context of the kind of literature that you're studying. Number four, be sure to factor in the atmosphere. Noted in observation, remember we looked at the atmosphere, now we're gonna factor it into interpretation, the feeling, the emotion, the mood of the passage. Go ahead and look at Romans 9, one through three, and then 10, one, and look at that, and, and look at 1 Corinthians six thirteen as well. Just determine the atmosphere there, see if you can kind of get the feel for what's going on there. Number five, consider the author's viewpoint and purpose. What's the purpose of, of John, uh, the, the Gospel of John? Remember, look over in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. First John 5, 13, we looked at that. Remember, I write these things to you who believe in the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The purpose of, of 1 John is to, is to give Christians confidence that they're saved, right? 
Number six, be aware of progressive revelation. See, revelation progresses through the Bible. Things that were not very clear as it began early on in the Old Testament in Genesis become more and more clear. As we go through the Bible and history, God progressively reveals more and more about himself and his will. It's like a blooming flower. The Old Testament to New Testament, there's that progression of revelation. You know, when you look at the Leviticus 11, the dietary laws, and then you now go ahead and look at Le Leviticus 11 and then bump over to Mark 7, 16, Acts 10, 15, and Romans 14, 2, and Galatians 5, 6 and see what it says about those as the progress of revelation is more clear in the New Testament. You know, you look at Numbers 18, 7, look at the priesthood versus 1 Peter 2, 9, that we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. See? Exodus 28 uh, talks about the Sabbath. Bump over to Colossians 2.16 and Romans 14.5 and 6. See what that says about the Sabbath. Progress of Revelation. Key in understanding and interpreting the Bible, friends. Number seven, remember the unity of Scripture principle. The Bible correctly interpreted does not contradict itself. Interpret the obscure and unclear in light of the obvious and clear, not vice versa. Seemingly con contradictive passages, either you've misinterpreted one or the other <laughs> or both. Uh, looking at some examples there, go ahead and look at Matthew 27, 5 and 10 versus Acts 1, 16 through 20. Look at that. Uh, it's a contrast there because uh, when one says Jesus hanged himself, but then it says in Acts uh, that he fell headlong and burst open. Is that a contradiction? Did somebody get it wrong? Well, uh, if you're going to hang yourself back in the day, uh, you're probably going to jump out of the top of a tree. The tree was on a hill. The rope broke and maybe he smashed on the rocks below. Hung on the tree until the body rotted and burst open. Who knows? Hard sayings commentary will uh, explain this. Number eight, consider the interpretations of others, but do your own work first. Uh, look at Acts 17.11. And uh, read through that. Anyway, secondhand information must be balanced with firsthand discovery. Do your own work first and then see if they got it right. Because, of course, after all, you are master theologians now with your Bible scene investigative tools. So, after you prayed, observed, made a list of interpretive questions, answered the questions with research and following the guidelines. Write an interpretive conclusion in your own words. First, you want to summarize your thoughts and findings in one or several paragraphs. The exercise of writing in your own words will clarify. See, thoughts disentangle themselves when they pass through the lips and the fingertips. Talk it out. Second, you want to crystallize your interpretation into one clear, concise, carefully worded sentence. This should be written in third person, past tense, from the perspective of the original author to his audience. This is the exegetical idea. One complete, simple sentence. No ands, because that means two thoughts. So until you can write an interpretive conclusion in your own words in one simple sentence, you have not interpreted the passage, and you do not know yet what it means. Avoid you and we. Don't be fuzzy or vague. Be crystal clear, concise, exact. So here's some examples of interpretive conclusion statements, some passages that we've looked at, all right? The exegetical idea. So if we were going to do all of this, uh, all the whole process that we've done so far for Matthew 6, 7, then our interpretive conclusion would be, Jesus warned his disciples not to babble meaninglessly like the pagan religions when they prayed. Sounds really complicated, doesn't it? I'm being sarcastic, of course. Psalm 51, 11, and 12. King David begged God not to remove his kingship because of his sin with Bathsheba. Mark 9, 43 and following. Jesus described the awful nature of eternity, eternal hell, by comparison with the perpetual fires and maggots of the city garbage dump in Jerusalem, Gehenna. John 13, 25, and 26. The wicked nature of Judas' betrayal was amazingly manifested by his accepting the seat of honor next to and the Passover bread from the hand of Jesus.
John 10, 22 through 24. Jesus refused the demands of the Jews for a political military Messiah like Judas Maccabeus, calling them instead to follow him as the shepherd Messiah of Israel prophesied in the Old Testament. Bottom line, if you know how to ask the right questions, find the answers and connect the dots, using eight hermeneutical guidelines, you can understand and interpret the Bible and now for our next opportunity. I've handed you uh, the, the assignment. I, I emailed you the assignment number five, where we're going to write an interpretive conclusion statement by first completing the handout assignment for Exodus 33, 7 through 11. And uh, many of you have sent me assignments already. Thank you for that. Uh, some of you have only given me the interpretive conclusion and surprisingly got it right without even doing any of the legwork whatsoever. But I need you to do all of the legwork. So I'm going to escape out of this and I'm going to toggle over here to our assignment number five. And I'm going to blow this up right here. And hopefully you can see that. Let me blow it up a little bit more for you in view. And we'll just zoom to 200% there. So uh, the assignment is an interpretive interpretation of Exodus 33, 7 through 11. And we're going to do an interpretation of our focal passage, Exodus 33, 7 through 11, especially on our focal verse. This is what you want to key on, friends. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face just as a man speaks to his friend. And here's the key, all right? You're going to explain what this verse means in light of other passages in the Bible which indicate that no human has ever seen God and cannot see the invisible God. So you see John 1.18 says, No man has seen God in any time. First Timothy 6.16, both of these written long after the passage in Exodus, whom man has never seen nor can see. So you're going to interpret an answer. Why does the passage say Moses spoke to God face to face is this a contradiction in the Bible? What does the passage mean? How can both statements be true? Special note, you want to not use a Bible commentary, study Bibles, and handouts, uh, or handbooks or anything. You must complete this assignment using an ESV Bible without study notes. The observation tools thus learned far, this far in the course, prayer, and of course, the assistance of the Holy Spirit and the mind the Lord has given you. Think. Become an exegete. So here's the assignment. You're going to include all of these things. And of course, uh, the handout that I gave you, it lists all of these for you. But you're going to need to drop down here and click there and then hit enter. So you can maybe see that right now. And then start typing in. You're going to do one, two, three, four, and five. So you're going to include 15 good significant observations of the vocal passage and the related Bible text using the four contextual questions, who, what, when, where, salt, structure, atmosphere, literary form, and terms, figures of speech, and laws of emphasis. Then you're going to do a word study on one significant word. Hint, hint, it's probably face, because of course we're looking to say why, see why it says face to face. So you're going to do a word study on face using your Strong's Concordance or your Vines Expository Dictionary. Then you're going to list at least seven interpretive questions with answers where possible. You want to, want, want to ask some really cognitive questions. And I sent these out to you so that you have them. So feel free to use the ones that I sent you. Then finally, you're going to write an interpretive overview of two to three paragraphs. By the way, a paragraph is six to nine sentences. So two to three paragraphs summarizing your findings and defending your interpretation. And then finally, in one complete sentence, you're going to write an interpretive conclusion statement for the passage, and you're going to want to email that to me. Uh, it's actually due this Thursday, but I'll give you a little extra time uh, to uh, to jump on this and, and get some things going with, with, with that. So if you have any questions, uh, you can email me at douglas.brooks at cbshouston.edu, or if you still have your syllabus, you can call me. And uh, feel, free to, feel free to call my, my number there at the office, and it actually is going to dial directly into my cell. So uh, I'm happy to help you out in any way that I can. Uh, we'll work through this together, and, uh, and really the goal is for us to uh, together determine uh, the one main point of this passage. So I'm going to spin this around here uh, so you can look at me here uh, lastly, 
Uh, I miss you greatly, but please know that I've been praying for you and that uh, we will get through this together. And, uh, you know, whatever you're going through, uh, please know that uh, the Lord is still on his throne. He is still in charge and, uh, and his purposes will be fulfilled. So prayerfully, uh, just uh, spend some time with the Lord, spend some time in this passage, and may God bless you and keep you.